half of the tribulation period. But you see the little world uh, on fire there. That graphic tells you where we are, and it's going to move along uh, the bottom of the screen there. And that tells you where you are in the timeline for the tribulation period. So we're halfway. So the seventh trumpet has been blown, uh, which introduced this, the seven bowl judgments. Do not misunderstand that the seventh trumpet is one and the same as the last trump. The last trump that's referred to in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 15 is not the same thing as the last trumpet judgment that is described for us in uh, the book of the Revelation related to the tribulation. That's one of the things that gets people thrown off and they say, well, it must be mid-trib because the seventh trumpet is blown mid-trib and therefore the last trump. But guys, let me just tell you, the last trump is an expression. It's a nomenclature that refers to the voice of God bringing forth an announcement. There's going to be trumpets all throughout the millennium. And that's way into the future on our timeline. So if you're really going to be literal about the last trump, then the rapture is not going to happen until way sometime late in the millennium. So be careful. So the bull judgments. Let's just start working through these. Uh, the bold judgments themselves, beginning Revelation chapter 15, verse 1, then I saw another sign in heaven. Great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them the wrath of God is complete. This tells us that this last three and a half years is definitively the outpouring of the wrath of God. Now, the entirety of the seven-year period is the judgment of God. There is a judgment that is being executed on Israel because they did not allow the land to rest as per the law, and God said, I'm taking back those years. This is the last seven years of those judgments against Israel for not giving the land its Sabbath rest. We've covered all that before. And so the, the judgment of God is being poured out throughout the whole seven years which one could equate with the wrath of God. The wrath of Satan is also being poured out during these last seven years. This is a unique period of history unlike anything else. And so in this context, we are getting to the end. And it's the midway point, and this angel gives this uh, announcement. The seven last plagues are here. For in them, the wrath of God is complete. And out of the temple came the seven angels having the seven plagues clothed in pure bright linen and having their chests girded with golden bands. Then one of the four living creatures, remember the seraphim and the cherubim and so forth in the, in the heavens. We, we didn't really cover that, but you that are familiar with scripture know these things. Uh, one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. So now this is being commissioned and let's go. Bowl number one, the first angel goes out and pours out his bowl. Uh, I think some of your Bibles might use the word vial, uh, like a vial being poured out versus a bowl or uh, some other uh, device. Don't, don't get caught up in the, the phraseology. These are containers that are used to pour out the wrath of God in the symbolism as is described. So the first went out and poured his bowl upon the earth and a foul and loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those who worshiped his image. Now we're talking about the attributes of the tribulation. I think we did talk about the mark of the beast, the number of the, the man's name equating 666. I think we covered all that already. Um, by the second half of the tribulation, the mark of the beast will be mandatory. In the first half of the tribulation, it seems it's more of a voluntary thing as is increasing in its intensity. So by this time, you have people that have already voluntarily taken the mark. By the second half, it seems that people are forced to take it or else you can't buy, sell, or, or have any kind of commerce. And those that refuse to take it are going to uh, be executed. And so we keep those things in mind. So this foul and loathsome sore comes upon the men who had the mark of the beast and who worshipped 
his image. And I can already hear your thinking. Uh, what about the mark of the beast? Is it a microchip? You know, what does that mean? Uh, we, you better save your questions up, okay? Otherwise, we'll never get through this. And we, we still have the whole millennium and after the millennium to deal with. So we're going to be here, well, hopefully till Jesus comes. Amen? Yeah. Bull number two. The second angel poured out his bull on the sea, and it became blood. As of a dead man, and every living creature in the sea died. Now, remember in the first half, what happened in the first half? One third of the rivers became blood. One third of the seas became blood. In this case, the entirety, all of it is not one third, all of it. And so the, the sea became blood as of a dead man. And every living creature in the sea died. Then a third angel poured out his bull on the rivers and springs of water. And they became blood. So now not one-third of the rivers, all of them. Bull number four. Then the fourth angel poured out his bull on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God, who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. Pay attention to that sentence, that last sentence. They did not repent and give him glory. You would think that this would be where men would be saying, okay, we give. But this isn't what happens. The same thing happens in hell. The Bible talks about people that are in hell who gnaw their tongues for pain and curse the God who made them. Uh, this is an amazing demonstration of the rebellious nature of man. And this isn't the first time you'll see this tonight. The fifth bull... Then the fifth angel poured out his bull on the throne of the beast and his kingdom became full of darkness and they gnawed their tongues because of the pain. Stop and think about that for a minute. Didn't we talk about uh, a spiritual darkness that is physically experienced uh, in times past? There it is. Um, they gnawed their tongues because of the pain of the darkness that has come upon them. So this is a very interesting, unique uh, manifestation of the judgment and wrath of God. They blaspheme the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and they did not repent of their deeds. Again, this is revisited. Uh, you're looking at a progression of pain not bringing mankind to its knees. The sixth angel poured out his bull on the great river Euphrates and its water was dried up so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. We could talk about the geography here. You know that the Euphrates River is where the uh, city of Babylon is located. It is to this day in uh, Babylon, I mean uh, Iraq. Uh, there's a lot we could talk about there. But this is interesting because the great river Euphrates and its water was dried up so that the way of the plural kings of the east might be prepared it's been said by many that this is china uh, but let's not forget that it's using the plural uh, kings so the the uh, eastern all of the eastern countries uh, joining together in their force against israel uh, to make their way to israel this is what's happening with the gog magog invasion remember russia and turkey syria uh, parts of Egypt, uh, the, uh, what you know today is Iran, uh, Persia. All of these are joining forces together against Israel at this period of time. And all the nations of the earth are gathered together around Israel to stomp her out. We'll, we'll talk more about that. The demon spirits that are called to Armageddon are referenced here in Revelation 16. I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of demons. Now let's read that again. Three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, Satan, out of the mouth of the beast, the Antichrist, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, his assistant. Uh, see, remember we talked about the unholy trinity? There it is again. Performing signs. Uh, these are the spirits of demons performing steins, which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day 
of God Almighty. Um, I probably should just keep going, but let me at least tell you a quick story here uh, about a vision I had of a frog. It's a weird, weird story. Uh, I'm not prone to visions. I don't, I don't have uh, all kinds of, you know, every day I come, you know, hi, Brenda, how are you today? By the way, God has spoken to me again. Here's another vision. Write it down in a book. I, you know, but I've had two or three really, really pronounced weird experiences like this in my Christian life. I was in, um, I think it was Wairica, California. Anybody might know that. Is that the one that's kind of uh, a little bit on the coast? Eureka? Okay, Eureka. Maybe it was Eureka. Whatever it was. Wairica, Eureka. Man, they should change the name. It's like Athel. What a <laughs> weird name. Um, I think it's a guy's name though, right? <laughs> I'm going to stop right there. That's it. <laughs> Is anyone visiting today? It's not always like this. Um, anyway, so <laughs> these guys, these guys, I know, sir. These guys actually called me and they said, we want to have a revival in our church and we'd like you to come and be our guest speaker. Now, I don't know if about you, but I'm a little skeptical about, you know, canned revivals. But you've, if you've been in the church any length of time, you know back in the day, churches used to say, it's revival week, we're going to have a revival meeting and have meetings all night and call people to repentance. And you know what? Hey, God meets the, that people where they are. And if you're calling people to repentance and renewal of their faith and stuff, God will meet people. Well, anyway, so they asked me to be their guest speaker. And so I came up there. I don't remember, Brenda, if you were with me on that trip or not. But anyway... Um, my custom is to pray before I, I teach or preach, and I was kind of preachy-teachy on that one because of the nature of the meeting. And I remember it was a Friday night, and I got there to the church, and I said, well, where's the place I can go pray? I want to pray. So I found a back room, and I went and got on my knees and just were seeking the Lord and saying, God, please uh, show me what you want me to know. T teach me what you want me to, to say to the people and just let you know your blessing be upon the people. And I had a vision of a frog on top of that church. And I thought, what in the heck is this? I'm not telling nobody this, right? So anyway, I ignored it. And I went to uh, preaching and had the greatest time of my life and absolutely no response. Nobody, they, you know, those were altar call days. This was all the stuff. And I thought, well, man, you know, everybody, it's time to, you know, come and let's seek the Lord. Nobody, nothing. Dead in a doornail. <sighs> now it's Saturday night. I, I know, it's, it's Saturday night, and I'm, let me find a place to pray. And I go and I pray, and I'm seeking the Lord, and just, oh, God, please, you know, speak to my heart. And I have a vision of this frog on top of this church again. And I said, what in the world is this? And I'm, there's no way I'm telling anybody about this, right? This is a true story, by the way. And so I thought, this is the craziest thing. I've never had this kind of experience before. So now it's Sunday morning. I'm praying. God shows me this same vision. And I'm like, what is happening? Sunday night, last night. And by the way, altar call, nothing. People are dead. They're not singing. There's no prayer. There's nobody's repenting. I don't see one wet eye in the whole place. And I'm, in, I'm on my knees. Oh, God, please do something in this church. These people are paying me to make a revival happen. You got to do something. I mean, I'm just begging God for, for a miracle. And I have a vision of this frog on top of this church again. And I'm like, what is happening? And by this time, I decide I'm telling them. So I go in there and I said, look, you guys, I have no idea what's happening. But I told them, I said, I want to share this story with you. God has been showing me a vision of a frog on top of this church. And by this time, it was kind of developing. And this frog was reaching inside through a side window and pulling people out like this. And I shared all this with them, and I'm telling you, the place went crazy. The pastor had had the same vision the week before and told it to the church. So they all heard it before. And when I told them, I have no idea what this is all about. I have no idea. And by that time, you guys, man, I was a baby. I don't remember how old I was. I was probably a youth pastor. How much? 20? In my early 20s, I didn't know anything. And I barely knew the Bible. 
And now you come to a scripture like this, and I see three unclean spirits like frogs. And I'm thinking, what in the world is that? See, now I'm not saying demons look like frogs. Don't build more out of this than you should. But what an amazing thing and an experience that I had. Now, these spirits were the spirits of demons that the Bible says. And of course, by this time, even though not having a a really great grasp of Scripture, I ministered to him by telling him, look, this is a demon spirit. We've got to deal with it. And I mean, we had like a spiritual revival, really, in that church. And it was, they told me stories after that, like you can't believe the people were leaving and people were upset and there was all kinds of spiritual warfare and everything. Oh man, bizarre stuff. And uh, I just thank the Lord for how he does unusual things at times, doesn't he? Anyway, uh, they're performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to battle. First, let's talk about the signs. Wasn't it like two weeks ago, I won't say his last name, but Mike on Facebook. Mike, you know know who I'm talking about? Mike, the evangelist prophet down in Sacramento. I won't say his last name. You know who I'm talking about? He, when I, when this guy was discipling me, when I was a baby, baby Christian, he he came into me one day and he said, God has talked to me and told me that the way you're going to be able to tell the true church in the last days is they'll be producing signs and wonders. And immediately I was checked in my spirit. I said, that, no, that doesn't add up to me because I thought about the fact that the Antichrist can produce lying signs and wonders. I've seen Benny Hinn. You know, I mean, I've, I, there's, <clears throat> I'm not saying he's the Antichrist. I'm just saying there's a lot of, oh, brother. <clears throat> I'm in trouble, man. I'm a little hyper because I'm over, you know, it just never, never. The, the tr- yes, the cheesecake. So the thing is that these demon spirits can produce lying signs and wonders. And so guys, don't be deceived. If God does miraculous things, praise his name. But not every sign and wonder is God. We need to be very careful to, to obey and, and study and filter through the scriptures and the scriptures alone. Amen. Okay, so they're going to go out now and they're gathering together the nations of the earth to battle against the, uh, the Lord, the great day of the Lord. So what does that tell you? They're actually intentionally preparing themselves to fight with Jesus. And that's exactly what happens. The nations will, when they see the sky split and Jesus coming back, they will be surrounding Israel and they're going to actually turn away from Israel and as if they're going to fight with the one coming from the clouds on a white horse with his armies from heaven. Unbelievable. The Bible says that he will overcome them with the word of, the, of his mouth, the sword that proceeds from his mouth. They gathered them together to the place called Hebrew, in Hebrew, Armageddon. Armageddon, the valley of Armageddon, it's the valley of Jezreel, it's et cetera, et cetera in the Bible. Uh, valley of Jehoshaphat. <clears throat> Behold, I am coming quickly. This is the victor's cry. Jesus is... Uh, at this point in the timeline, you see our little graphic is moving across the screen. Uh, the, the Lord says, this is enough. I'm coming. You're gathering together against Israel. I'm going to rescue them. Now, there's some s- stuff happening. Just like, I digress again, forgive me. You look at uh, the Gog-Magog invasion. The, the Gog looks at, the, at Israel and says, look, let's go get them because they're in unwalled villages. Everyone's dwelling in peace. They don't have bars on their windows. Everything, they all think it's fine. That's going to happen during the first half of the tribulation. But the battle that they actually come together to formulate doesn't happen until seven years later. So you realize that time is moving along, but things aren't just happening in day or minute uh, increments like we might think uh, in our reading of the Bible. So... I'm coming quickly. He said that a long time ago too, by the way. That was 2,000 years ago. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air and a loud voice came out of the temple of he- from heaven from the throne saying, it is done. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings and there was a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake as had not occurred since men were on the earth. Now the great city was divided into three parts and the cities of the nations fell. The great Babylon, great city refers to Babylon in this context. 
The great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Then every island fled away and the mountains were not found and a great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Uh, massive. Now, a few things here. Again, I don't want to get us bogged down into a word-by-word -word Bible study on this, but let me at least mention that this is talking about the physical city of Babylon. We're going to come up to the mystery Babylon, which is a spiritual entity, and we've already talked about the political entity Babylon, which is uh, military and so forth. So we've got a lot to deal with related to Babylon. It was divided into three parts. There are three manifestations of Babylon in the Bible, as mentioned. And so now hail is coming. By the way, you, are you tracking the, the parallel syllable between the Egyptian plagues? Yeah, okay, you guys are good. Uh, men blaspheme God because of the plague of the hail, since the plague was exceedingly great. So the judgment of mystery Babylon. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bulls came and talked with me, saying to, to me, come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and of the filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots. And so I think it was, uh, I missed the last two Wednesdays, and so it was three Wednesdays ago, uh, we talked about the seven heads and the ten horns. Did we cover that? The seven world powers that relate to Israel, right? Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, uh, Rome, and then the revived Roman Empire. So your seven world kingdoms, that's the seven heads. The ten horns is the revived Roman Empire, uh, and the way it is developed. We talked about that. It's a confederation of ten nations uh, that were part of the earlier Roman Empire. That's important to know. So it's not America. Uh, and uh, then the, out of the revived Roman Empire will come the revived Grecian Empire. And so the, the, out of the Grecian Empire will come the guy called the Assyrian, and that guy is the Antichrist. So again, a lot of study there. We could spend weeks on just that, but there's a tidbit for you. Uh, and so this is Mystery Babylon. Now we're talking about the spiritual entity. Mystery Babylon, not the political, not the actual. That's been divided into the three parts, but now we're focusing on the spiritual Babylon. When we talk about mystery, mysterious, things that are hidden, unknown, we don't understand all the details. Certain mysteries are revealed to us in the Bible. The gospel is a mystery until it came to fruition in, in its fullest uh, revelation today. We understand the gospel. Uh, the hidden things that belong to the Lord made known. And so the mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. Wow, what is it? Who is it? Uh, well, we got a lot of discussion. Um, Roman Catholic Church. Uh, mystery Babylon, there's no doubt. But let's look. I want you to understand something. It's not just the Roman Catholic Church. It's every false religion. Every bit of filthiness of spiritual fornication. Now, obviously, you've got a lot of reasons to think about Rome uh, because it's a city on seven hills. You've got the chalice. It, you've got the, the, gar the garments of scarlet and purple and the filthiness. And I mean, you do the history on the Roman Catholic Church. I'm, and I, by the way, I'm not condemning the Roman Catholic Church in thinking the Protestant Church is without fault. It's got all kinds of problems too, so just be aware of that. But um, the Roman Catholic Church is clearly described here. But I would suggest to you that Mystery Babylon is every false religion combined. Everything that is anti-truth combined. And again, I don't want to pick on the Roman Catholics. I, I want you to make sure that you understand something. If you are a Catholic and you're in this room, I am not suggesting you're not saved. If you think that I'm saying that 
all Roman Catholic people are not saved, you're wrong. I do believe that there are people in the Roman Catholic Church that should not be in the Roman Catholic Church, but have genuine saving faith in the Lord, and their salvation is by grace through faith alone in Christ alone. But let me tell you what I am saying. Catholicism. Distinguish that between the Catholic person and Catholicism. Catholicism is a damned religion. It is focused entirely on death, it is Marian worship. It is a perpetual crucifixion of Christ in a Eucharistic worship. The, on the, ma the altars of the, the Catholic Church that contain a dead bone from a saint. I mean, you, everywhere you guys look, and if you've ever been to the Vatican, do you know that Vatica is a pagan deity? And that the Vatican was built on the hill that was and is to date a graveyard? And that the St. Peter's Basilica is a grave? You've heard about all this stuff. St. Peter's Basilica, you see all this stuff. That is supposed to be Peter's grave. I doubt that it actually is, but there is supposed to be Peter's grave. Last time I was at the Vatican, uh, we're walking through there and they had uh, popes encased in glass on display, dead. I mean, guys, they are glorifying the Christ that's still on the cross. I want to tell you something. There's a difference between a crucifix and a cross. The crucifix has Jesus still on it. Our cross is empty for a reason. Christ is alive. Amen. All right. So again, I'm not, don't, yeah, you can applaud that Christ is alive. I like that. Uh, I'm not picking on anybody. I'm just being clear, you know, and I don't want to, I, I, oh. I can't stand it when pastors and preachers are unwilling to just tell it like it is. We've got to tell people the truth so they can know. If you're here today and you're a Catholic and you're mad at me, that's okay. I can take it. You can take it. Ask yourself why you're mad. Ask yourself, is he right or wrong? Ask the questions to find out. If you do determine that I'm right, then I have done my job. Are you with me? All right, mission grace, I call this, because now we're getting toward the end of the tribulation. I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they have pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. In that day there shall be a great mourning in Jerusalem. I quote this verse all the time. You guys don't need a lot of ex explanation here, but let us just make one note. Unless God pours out a spirit of grace, you're doomed. And the good news is God is today in the church age, also referred to by many as the dispensation of grace, is pouring out his grace on all men and illuminating their hearts and life. The grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men. But that is not the case of all the me methods and mannerisms of the administration of the tribulation. And so now, at the end of the tribulation, the Lord says, I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. By this point, it is causing them by the spirit of grace to be poured out upon them and is causing them to look upon him whom they have pierced and mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. In other words, they are, by God's grace, illuminated to the fact that, oh no, we were wrong. Jesus is the Messiah. That's what's actually happening here. In that day, a fountain shall be opened for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and uncleanness. So God is pouring out this fountain. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. Somebody help me. What is it? And sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilt and stains. <laughs> Babylon the Great. Come out of her, my people. See, now we, we're mystery Babylon. Is it possible that God has 
people in Babylon, in mystery Babylon, even if it was the Roman Catholic Church, or hey, but what about the Mormon Church? What about the Jehovah's Witnesses? I'm telling you right now, there are people out there that belong to the Lord that are in the wrong places, and God is calling them out even now. And ultimately, we get down to this point, and he says, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins and lest you receive of her plagues. Now keep in mind, this is during the tribulation. The my people aspect here really relates to Israel and the cesspool of stuff that they've gotten themselves mixed up in, including antichrist worship, okay? Don't kid yourself if you think that uh, the antichrist worship, the humanism, that's what it is, is not part of Mystery Babylon. That's why I would never tell you that the Roman Catholic Church is Mystery Babylon. The Roman Catholic Church is part of it. So is Hinduism. Okay? Buddhism. Islam. Humanism. Okay? All of it. And for those of you that are practicing yoga, knock it off. You're laughing. I'm not. That is a Hindu practice. It is not something you should be doing. The Bible says have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. You say, oh, it's just stretching. No, it is a exercise designed by the Hindu faith. But why would I tell you this? Because I love you. I care about you. You know what? Go do stretches. I don't care. But don't practice yoga. Okay? M make a distinction about what it is. Oh, I have to talk about this now. I can't believe this. Do you know that the number one largest organization for the evangelization of the world is Hindu? Did you know that? The largest organized evangelistic organization in the world is Hindu. Not Muslim. Not Christian. And you know how they're getting Hinduism into the West? Yoga. That's just one of their steps. <clears throat> just look around. You'll see Eastern mysticism everywhere. Go to the grocery store and look at the tea counter. Now, am I saying if you eat yogi or drink yogi tea, you're going to go to hell? No. But if you have a choice, buy the you know, Fisher Price brand or something. That's a toy, I think. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Bigelow, okay. <laughs> come out of Babylon. Babylon the great is fallen. Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, lest you receive her plagues. Now, again, this is during the tribulation. This is not the church age. And those that say, look, no, we're worshiping the beast. We're going to have the mark of the beast. We're going to participate in mystery of Babylon. You're going to partake of her sins and be judged. You won't be here. You guys will not be here, okay? Because if you're alive when the rapture happens, you're gone. If you die before the rapture happens, you're gone. Okay? If you're, sa if you're not saved and you're here today and the rapture happens, you're going to be here. And so you better think hard about what we're talking about. Amen? Amen? All right. Call to the marriage supper. After these things, I heard a loud voice from the great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God, for true and righteous are his judgments, because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sat on the throne saying, Amen, Hallelujah. Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, you all you his servants. And I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude as the sound of many waters. And as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give glory for, give him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. And he said to me, right blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. So the marriage supper is going to be taking place. It doesn't happen until the beginning of the millennium, but this is the call that's going forth. The, the bride has made herself ready. She's been in the father's house for seven years. The marriage has been consummated. Now they're returning with their husband, right? That's you and me, the bride of Christ. 
returning with Jesus, our Savior, to come to the wedding feast, to be presented. By the way, the Jewish model, okay? The groom goes to the father's house, prepares a place. I'm just giving you the Jewish marriage model, not the Bible. Go, fa, the, the groom gets espoused to the bride, goes to the father's house, builds on the house. Dad says when the house is ready, he goes back, he gets his bride, takes her to the house. They consummate their marriage, and then seven days later, they go back to the bride's hometown and have a wedding feast. And that's why they ran out of wine at the Galilee, by the way. You remember Jesus made water into wine? They were partying for seven days straight, waiting, and they ran out of wine. This was not just an afternoon like we do today. Now, what does that mean? That means in a, in a, in a biblical scenario, Jesus said it, John 14, I go to prepare a place for you. If I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where, you, where I am, there you may be also. Uh, where I go, you know, and the way you know. So what happens is we are now, according to Paul the Apostle, I'm rushing, I realize that, we are betrothed to Christ. He has gone away to the Father's house. He's coming again to get us. He's going to take us to the Father's house. We're going to be there for seven years. We're going to consummate our marriage with the Lord. We're going to be clothed in white. We will be made ready. And then we're going to return with him from the wedding. Luke tells us this very clearly. At be as those that are waiting for their master who is returning from the wedding. So the wedding happens in heaven. And if you're the bride, you're there. Okay? Another proof text. Remember we talked about this. And he says, be ready like those that are waiting for the bride to return from the wedding. Who is he talking to? Jews, not the bride, not the church, okay? So he returns to the earth and then the wedding feast. And I'll even excite you a little bit more. Now, be nice. The wedding feast, according to, we're going to look at this in the next weeks, is going to be a, a participation of a, an actual feast, which will have, quote, many choice meats and a variety of wines on the lees. Then, okay, the second coming of Jesus. I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and he who sat on him was called faithful and true and, and the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses and out of his mouth goes a sharp sword and with it he should strike the nations and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. Revelation 19, continuing, he, he himself treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of God Almighty, and he had on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Does anybody know who that is? Uh, he goes to Edom first. Edom is in uh, Jordan. It is in the southern part of Jordan, Edom. Uh, then you have uh, um, Moab, and then you have Ammon, uh, Ammon, Jordan, you know it. It was Ammon in the biblical times. Who is this who comes from Edom? His dyed garments from Basra. This one who is glorious in his apparel, uh, traveling with the, the, in the greatness of his strength. I who speak in righteousness, he answers, mighty to save. Why is your apparel red and your garments like one who treads in the winepress? His answer, I have trodden the winepress alone and from the peoples no one was with me. For I have trodden them in my anger and trampled them in my fury. Their blood is sprinkled upon my garments and I have stained all my robes for the day of vengeance is in my heart and the year of my redeemed has come. So he goes to Edom first, then he's going to go to the Mount of Olives. On, in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east and the Mountain of Olives will be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. By the way, there is a fault line now known to exist running east to west right through the Mount of Olives to this day, making a very large valley. Half the mountain shall move toward the north and half toward the south. So that it's going to make the way of a zeal, the Bible says. I don't think I included that. I didn't. Uh, a zeal means a way of escape. And so the, the, the children of Israel that are in Jerusalem are going to get come out from Jerusalem where the judgment's going to be taking place there and in the valley of Armageddon and the battle that's taking place as the Lord is re uh, rescuing Israel. Then I saw an angel stand in the sun and he cried with a loud voice saying to the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather together the, to the great supper of God that you may eat the flesh of kings and captains and flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and of those who sit on them and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. I saw... The beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him 
who sat on the horse and against his army. They've already been going after Israel. Now it's turning against, uh, turning away from Israel after him. And against his army. Then the beast was captured and with him the false prophet who worked signs in the, his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire with brimstone, burning with brimstone and the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse and all the birds were filled with their flesh. So battle of Armageddon. I would like to suggest to you in my opinion that the Gog Magog invasion ends the same way and it is a description of the same event. That's my opinion. Mission accomplished. Uh, the Lord has poured out a spirit of grace on Israel. He is rescuing them. He is making war against the nations that have rejected Israel, that have been uh, harsh with her. He is going to tread uh, uh, upon them with his horse and the judgment will uh, be so severe, the Bible says that the, horse, the blood will run to the horse's bridle. Uh, do not desire, uh, mission accomplished, for I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved, as it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion, and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. That covenant, by the way, is the new covenant. Concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers, for the gifts and the callings of God are irrevocable. He called them, he uses them, he will fulfill his purposes in them. God will save Israel. And so all of Israel shall be saved. Does that mean that every Israeli will be saved? Does that mean that every Jew from all history will be saved? No. It's talking about those Jews that are alive at that time when he pours out that spirit of grace upon them and they look upon him whom they have pierced and they mourn for him as one mourns for his only son. And the, if you would go into Zechariah 12, 13, 14, there's a lot of homework there that you can read where they go and they mourn for 30 days according to the law and they are grieved in their homes separately by themselves, no celebration, until finally they are gathered together to the Lord, and they get to be celebrating his deliverance at the sheep and goat judgment, which will follow this event. And so then they will be entering in. Those that are the sheep will enter into the millennial kingdom. They will not be the bride. They will be the friends and the guests. So you, if you're reading your parables, you're going to say, well, you got the bride, you got the friends of the bridegroom, you got the guests, the guests need a garment. Where are they gonna get the garment? Same place you do, Jesus. But Jesus is gonna give them, from a fully different dispensation, a different group of people, Israel, that are gonna be provided garments and believers that are the sheep that treated Israel properly during the tribulation period for a lot of reasons, but mainly because by that time they will have understood the scriptures. They will have responded to the gospel. They will know the timeline of what's happening. Because from the abomination of desolation, remember, until the time that Jesus come is given by the day. So we know the day that the abomination of desolation takes place until the time that Jesus comes. It is spelled out for you directly in Daniel chapter 12, to the day. And so by then they're going to say, look, you guys, we only got two years. We only got a year and a half. We only got a year. Let's hold out. Let's stay in Jerusalem. Let, Jesus is coming to rescue us. And Babylon's going to fall. And Jesus is going to reign. And the kingdoms of this world the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever. Mission accomplished. Amen. That's it for tonight. So next week, <laughs> we will begin the attributes of the millennial kingdom. Lord, thank you for this time. Send us forth in your grace and peace, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great evening.